Hello, this is lesson three, part one of sixth grade oceans, atmosphere, and climate. The title for today's lesson is Air Temperatures Around the World. Before we start, I want you to think about one place you know on our planet that you've been to or maybe heard about that's very warm. And one place that you have either been to or heard about that's really cold. I can tell you that one place that I know about that's very, very warm is Hawaii. I have seen lots of pictures of friends who have been on vacation there. Maybe you have or you know someone who has, and it seems like they have very warm temperatures there. And one place that I know that's very cold is Iceland. Maybe because the name of it is Iceland, I thought of it, but um, I've, I've heard it's pretty cold there. Okay, so... As we're starting, there are a couple of things that you're going to need. One, you'll need something to write on, to write with. I have a notebook that I'm going to be using to take notes. And then this is really important. You need another person to talk to. The, um, the reason for that is because lots of times when you're thinking of new ideas, having someone to discuss them with will help you develop your ideas even more. And then the last thing that you might need is a flashlight. Now, don't worry if you don't have a flashlight. Okay, so... As we, we're getting started, there's a new vocabulary word that we need to learn, which is equator. And maybe it's one that you already know, but there's a picture here of the, the planet, and there's a red line here that says equator. Equator is just an imaginary line that divides Earth into a northern and a southern hemisphere. So um, as we're thinking about the planet, everything north of the equator is in the northern hemisphere, and everything south is in the southern hemisphere. Okay. So, the next vocabulary word is latitude. And latitude is just how far away you are from the equator. So you can't know this word unless you know the word equator. So the definition is the distance of a place north or south of Earth's equator. And if you look at this map here, you can see that there is a line down the middle of this map that's labeled as zero degrees and it's also labeled as equator. And then if you go to the next line, it says 20 degrees north. And if you go to the one beneath the equator, it says 20 degrees south. So the number there, the latitude line, just tells you how far away you are from the equator. If you're at 60 south, that just means that you're 60 lines below the equator. So we're going to take a look at a couple maps. And as we're thinking about these maps, I want you to think of two things. One. What is this map showing and what patterns do you notice? This is where having someone to talk to is such a great idea. So I would love for you to pause this video if you're able to and just quickly discuss with someone else what you think this map is showing, what patterns you notice. You can also write some notes in your notebook, just a couple of things that you're noticing about this map. It's very colorful. It's very complicated, it looks like. Okay. So if you've paused it, welcome back. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the things that we can notice about this map. One, there's this key at the bottom, and it tells us um, different numbers, and then it says degrees Celsius. So I can infer that this is telling me the temperature and that each color corresponds with the color on the map, and that's what temperature it is. And I noticed that along the equator, the colors here are oranges and reds, which correspond with the degrees Celsius that are hotter. And then down below, and also at the top, I see a lot of blue, which tells me that those temperatures are quite cold. And that is really cold. Look at that color there. It looks like it's negative 20 degrees. Ah, oh, that's very cold. So Iceland, which is this little dot right there, that's one place that I thought was cold. And if I look at it, I can see, yeah, it's the average temperature there. Looks like it's between 0 and 5.2 degrees Celsius. And another place that I thought that was very warm is Hawaii, which you can see right there. It's a little chain of islands, and it's right there in that orange, which shows that the average temperature there is, you know, pretty warm compared to some other places. You can see it's right kind of in this dark orange or right above the dark orange. Whereas where we live here in Seattle, it's more along this like lime green color or yellow. So there's a lot of things to notice here on this map, but let's look at this next map because different kinds of maps can convey different kinds of information. And what do you notice about this map? 
you can pause the video and talk about it with your friend or someone that you're at your house or you can take a moment to take some notes. I'm going to sit and look at it and try to see what I think about it. One thing that I notice here is it doesn't have quite the same amount of color as the map that we were just looking at and the lines are very horizontal. I'm noticing that as well. The key here says that the light orange that's right along the equator says most energy from the sun and then the white line which is here at the south pole and the north pole show least energy from the sun. I notice the title says incoming energy from the sun. So I will infer that this map is telling me that the closer I am to the equator the more energy that part of the earth is getting from the sun. Why would that be? I'm going to show you another picture and this picture might help us kind of understand why the incoming energy from the sun would be different at the equator. The thing to remember is that earth is round. It's a globe and the reason why that's important is that explains why it's warmer in Hawaii and colder in Iceland. So if you look at here that this picture is showing on the very far left side of the screen there is this sort of yellow line and that represents the sun. Now the sun is 150 million kilometers away and they're making it seem like it's really close but it's not. Don't be fooled. It's very far away. And the energy that comes from the sun, when it arrives on Earth, it's all traveling horizontally. The sun is very huge and it's very far away. And all the light that's hitting the sun, or sorry, coming from the sun to Earth, is just hitting the Earth straight on. At the equator, where the Earth is facing head on to where the sun is, the sun's rays come in. And if you look at this, you can see that we have to do a little bit of math here, but math is fun, so that's perfect. The lines are coming in here, and the angle that they are to the Earth's surface is a 90 degree angle. But if you look at the top portion of this, of this graphic, it shows that these rays are coming in, and if you look at the angle there that they're hitting, it's a much lower angle. Here it looks like it's about 45 degrees for where it goes in, and then the angle there, do you see that? Versus this angle here, which is 90 degrees. And if you look at this, you can see that the smaller area uh, at the equator is actually receiving the same amount of energy as this larger area here. The amount of energy that's coming from the sun is the same, but the distance across Earth's surface, the area that it covers, is actually quite a bit bigger. So you can actually use your flashlight for this to show how energy can um, change intensity by the angle that it comes in at. So if you have a flashlight, you can try this. You can turn it on, and when you turn it on, you can see that there is a circle of light that comes from the flashlight. So you might also have a flashlight on your phone, but it doesn't work quite as well. So if you have that kind of flashlight, what you're looking for is the kind of flashlight where you can get a circle like that. Okay. So let me show you the directions for this activity. It's fun to do science out of school. So I'm going to have my picture disappear for just a moment so that you can see the, the words on the page. So here are the directions. Start by pointing your flashlight straight down onto a table. It works better if you turn the lights on off in the room that you're in or if you do this activity at night so that you can see the circle of light from your flashlight. And then point the flashlight straight down and notice how intense the light is from that circle. And then take the flashlight and turn it at an angle as this picture is showing here. Now it's important to try to keep the same distance from the table. We don't want to change all the variables. We just want to change the angle. You don't have to use a ruler. You can just kind of like eyeball it. But I want you to try to get as close to the table as you were both times. So that's the same. And then the last part is just, what do you notice? And one of the things that I notice as I look at this is that the circle of light here is much more intense than when it comes at an angle because that amount of energy has to spread out over a larger distance. And that's what's happening here on our planet. The amount of energy that is 
coming in near the poles is less intense than the amount of energy that's coming in at the equator. So how does that affect the amount of energy that comes? Well, if we look at this picture one more time, we can see that because the energy comes in more intensely at the equator, locations on Earth near the equator actually get more energy from the sun than locations that are further away because the energy from the sun is spread out over a greater distance. Now, if our planet was a cube shape then or was flat, then that wouldn't happen. But because our planet is a globe, that's why the equator is so much warmer than the poles. Okay, so let's go ahead and explore the sim for a little bit, just to kind of show how the energy might be different at different places. So um, if you have uh, an account on Amplify, if you're a sixth grader in Seattle and you can get onto your account, then go ahead and do that. If you don't have access to Amplify either because you aren't um, with a computer or something like that, don't worry, I'm gonna go ahead and explore it with you. So let's go ahead and go to Amplify, then you click on the global navigation menu and scroll down until you see oceans, atmosphere, and climate and click on that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Okay, open the sim and this is what we can see. I changed the temperature view from none to surface because I want to see a map that looks similar to the map that we were just looking at. And what I see here is that, yeah, that's very similar to what the other map that we were looking at. Along the equator, there are um, red and orange colors, which indicate that the temperature is greater. And near the poles, the temperatures are um, much colder. So let's go ahead and hit play and I'm going to start moving some water around and you can see that even as the water moves around by the equator it tends to be it tends to be warmer and even the water isn't really changing that a lot. So that's interesting. Okay so we'll explore the sim a lot more in the next lesson in lesson four but for now I just wanted to point it out to you to see that you can see that our computer model that we're using during this unit is similar to how planet Earth works. So the question that we need to try to understand is how are energy and temperature connected? And as I'm looking at this, I can see these two maps here. There's the incoming energy from the sun and the global air temperature. And I think that what we've discovered as we've been doing this lesson together is that we've discovered that the amount of energy that comes from the sun directly affects the global air temperature. Locations near the equator are warmer because they're receiving more energy from the sun. So the investigation question that we started with today is why do different locations have different air temperatures? And um, what I'd like you to do is pause the video and in your notebook I want you to write down um, an answer to this question and try to use some of the vocabulary words that we've used. Energy, temperature, and latitude. Now don't go on in this video if you can pause it without writing down your ideas first. I'm going to give you a moment to make sure that you're pausing it and writing down your ideas. If you don't want to write your ideas down or if you're not able to, instead what you can do is talk to someone about your ideas. Just tell them what do you think is the answer to why do different locations have different air temperatures. Okay, I'm about to show you our second key concept for this unit and we are so excited about this. So our second key concept which you should definitely write down find where you wrote down the first key concept and write it there with it so that we can have a collection of key concepts. The closer a lo location is to the equator the more energy it receives from the Sun. We discovered that together. Therefore a location's air temperature is affected by its distance from the equator. That word is getting cut off by my picture, sorry. Hope you can see it. So this is really important. This helps us understand that when we're thinking about how El Nino is affecting Christchurch, the thing we need to remember is that the distance that Christchurch is from the equator affects how much energy it's getting from the sun. Okay, this is the end of lesson three, part one. And um, the next video will be Lesson 3, Part 2, and we're going to explore this a little bit more. Okay, this is Lesson 3, Part 2. 
for sixth grade oceans, atmosphere, and climate. And in this part, we're going to be evaluating new evidence. For this part of the lesson, the three things that you'll need are something to write with and on and another person to talk to. Okay, so we're going to start this part of the lesson by getting a new email from Kitty Parada. So Kitty Parada is the director of the New Zealand Farm Council. And in lesson one, we saw our first email from her. So if you haven't seen lesson one, you should go back and watch it because this whole lesson will make more sense if you've seen lesson one and two first. Okay, so here's what Kitty says. Now that you have learned more about what determines a location's temperature, you are ready to begin helping us determine why Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature is cooler than usual in El Nino years. I am sending evidence that might help, might help you with this investigation. Please review the evidence carefully. Remember, your research will help the farmers be better prepared to protect their crops and livestock from temperature changes in the future. Best regards, Kitty. Kitty Parada, Director of the New Zealand Farm Council. So Kitty brings up a couple of really important things, which is, why is this so important? Why would the Farm Council of New Zealand be reaching out to scientists to understand more about El Nino? And many different organizations reach out to scientists to find answers to questions, and that's why it's so important for you as a student climatologist to try to understand this so that we can give Kitty Parada some information about this to help the farmers in New Zealand. Okay, so let's look at some of the new evidence. So here's some evidence that Katie Parada sent for us. The first thing that she is pointing out to us is a graph that we have already received, but I want you to notice a couple of things in the graph. One, what does this graph show? And what questions do you have about the information on the graph? So pause the video and in your notebook, take a moment to answer question one and two. There's a couple of things that I'm going to point out to you that you might be noticing on your own, which is that this graph has a vertical, which goes up and down. The y-axis is showing the degrees in Celsius. That's how warm or cold something is measured by temperature. And there's two bar graphs. The first one shows the temperature in Christchurch, New Zealand during a normal year and during El Nino in, sorry, and the temperature the air temperature in Christchurch, New Zealand during an El Nino year. Now we've seen this graph before and we've realized that El Nino years have a colder temperature, which means they are, um, the air temperature has less energy. So um, you'll notice that the two graphs have different temperatures. Knocked over my flashlight. Put that away. So what questions do you have? I mean, I wonder why. Why is this happening? Like, what's different about El Nino? So, Kitty promised us new evidence, and this is old evidence, so let's take a look at the new evidence. Okay, so, in the new graph, you'll notice that the picture at the top, or sorry, the label at the top is different. This is the average ocean surface temperature near Christchurch, New Zealand. And if I look at this, it's similar to what I saw in the air temperature of Christchurch, New Zealand, which is this graph. And in this one, I can see that during a normal year, the surface temperature of the ocean off the coast of Christchurch, New Zealand is 13 degrees Celsius. But during El Nino years, the ocean temperature is very cold. It's only 11 degrees Celsius. So I wonder, like, what questions do you have about the information on the graph? I wonder why. Why is this happening? Why is it so cold during El Nino years in the ocean temperature? It's weird that both the air temperature and the ocean temperature in Christchurch, New Zealand are colder during El Nino years. Is the ocean getting affected by the air or is the air being affected by the ocean? Like, is the ocean colder because the air is colder? Or is the air colder because the ocean's colder? I mean, I have so many questions about this. This would be a great time to pause the video and discuss with your friend or whoever you're choosing to do this lesson with to come up with some ideas that you might have, things you're wondering about. This last graph that we're going to look at is the energy from the sun at Christchurch, New Zealand. Now remember that the amount of energy that comes from the sun is affected by how far away you are from the equator. We saw that when we did our activity in... Um, the last part of this lesson, lesson three, part one. But 
why is this happening? I noticed that it's the same. That during a normal year and during El Nino years, the amount of energy that comes from the sun is the same. So let's take a look at these three graphs. So far we've looked at question one and two, but now I'm gonna ask you a third question. How is the evidence connected to what you've been learning about climate, temperature, and energy? So far we've learned that locations closer to the equator receive more energy from the sun than locations further from the equator. So this means that a location's latitude affects its surface and air temperature. And that's what we're, we're seeing here. The temperatures in Christchurch, New Zealand are colder than they are in Hawaii and other places that are near the equator, but hmm. But its air temperature is still cooler during, during El Nino years. We see that here. And also its ocean surface temperature is colder during El Nino years as well. But the amount of energy that comes from the sun is the same. So I think it's time right now for us to think back about the question that we're trying to, we're trying to solve for the Farm Council of New Zealand. They've asked us to help them understand why, during El Nino years, why is the Christchurch New Zealand's temperature cooler than usual? And when we first started this unit, we had a bunch of different ideas. We thought maybe it had to do with the amount of energy from the sun or something about the surface or something about the air. And as I'm looking at these three claims, I wonder, do the graphs support or go against any of these claims about um, Christchurch during El Nino years? So pause the video and take a moment to write some notes or talk to a friend. And I know that some of you can't pause the video, so I'm gonna pause talking for a moment because I think this is really important. I want you to ask yourself, is there any of these claims that we could support with the evidence that we've seen from the graphs? And are there any of these claims that are not supported by the information that we've seen from the graphs? Let's just take a moment to think about that. Okay, did you write some notes? Okay, so I'm looking at this and I, I realized that claim one does, it's not supported by the data that we have. If I look here, I can see that the data that Kita Parada has sent us about the amount of energy that they are receiving from the sun in a normal year and an El Nino year remains the same. Which means that I think that we can totally eliminate claim one. When we were first thinking about why this might be happening, we wondered if the amount of sun might be changing, um, or the amount of energy from the sun, and it's pretty clear that it's not changing. So we're kind of left with these two questions, which is what is happening in the air or what's happening with the surface that might be affecting El Nino? So now we have a new mystery about the ocean. Why is the ocean near Christchurch a different temperature than we'd expect for its latitude? It's, it's colder during El Nino years, but why? So we're gonna have to explore that in the next lesson. So I'll see you in lesson four, where we'll, we'll start exploring a little bit more about ocean, temperatures and why they might be different during El Nino years. Okay, bye.